Well, today we're wrapping up our series called Invisible God. And if you haven't been with us, I'll catch you up in just a minute. But um, as we said at the outset, um, this is not a comprehensive uh, series on the spirit of God, but uh, we wanted to look at it from a different perspective. And specifically, the very first week, we began with this idea uh, that Moses introduced us to with the ruah of God, this, this word in the, the Hebrew language that, that's translated spirit in Genesis 1 and 2 and 3 and then throughout the the Old Testament. And this word ruah, while it's translated spirit, it can also be translated, if you remember, it can be translated wind or breath or conscious or mind. And these are things that are telling uh, us something about the spirit of God, that the thing that these all have in common is that they're all invisible animating energies. And so, so you don't get freaked out if this is your first time here. You need to go back and, and check out the series. This is not some new age idea. This is another way to say that there's an unseen power of God that's at work in our world. And his presence is felt and experienced through his invisible animating energy, this unseen power in our world. And it's a power for creating. We said the first week that, that the spirit has this power for creating, specifically creating order from chaos that in our lives and is sim similar to the very beginning of creation that the spirit of God took chaos and he, he sort of recreated it into order. And that's what he does in our lives. That's the promise of what the spirit does in our lives is, is he has a creative power for creating uh, new life in us, creating uh, order from our chaos. He also is an empowering spirit. We talked last week about what it is to access or tap into the power of the spirit that's given universally to people. That in the Old Testament, the power of the Spirit was given selectively, and it was, was given uh, just for a period of time, a short period of time. And in the New Testament, his, his Spirit was given universally and continually to people. We talked last week, what does it look like for us, not in a mystical way, but in a very real way, to be empowered by God's presence and God's Spirit in our lives. And today, we're going to turn our attention to the guiding power of God how we walk with the Spirit in our lives. Uh, Paul says that in him, this is sort of his summary, is in him we live and we move, we're empowered, and we have our being or we, we find our way. This invisible animating energy of God, his unseen power has an ability to not only recreate and build order in our lives and empower us, empower us but he has an ability to empower us in a specific direction to guide us personally in our lives. Now, this is where uh, conversations about the Spirit of God often get strange for people. And it's because many of us, in some cases, we've seen uh, or witnessed uh, the name of God or the Spirit of God um, used to manipulate people, or it's misused or it's abused. And, and they've, they've done this in the name of, of God's power or God's leading their lives. I'm going to come back to that in a few minutes, but that causes us to have a specific view of the spiritual realm. Those of us who, who've witnessed or had some baggage or experience with that. In fact, when we think of the spiritual realm, you, you may have had an experience that's, that's something that seems weird, that you couldn't, it didn't really make sense to you or it was scary in that, you know, you were, you were like, I, I, don't, I don't want to be around that. I don't know what's going on with that. I, I can't explain what's happening there. At the very least, it was unnatural. And these experiences, these weird and scary and unnatural experiences have caused us to avoid or to minimize or even to dismiss the idea that the Spirit has the ability to not only empower us, but to guide us in a certain way or to dictate or drive or for us to be directed, our, our actions and our lives to be directed by Him. And I, I, wanna, I wanna talk a little bit about a biblical framework of that today. Because I, I, I think by avoiding and minimizing and dismissing, oftentimes we miss the Spirit's guiding and directing in our lives. And one of the reasons is, is because as Westerners, um, we like to uh, anchor everything in time and space. We want everything to be logical. We want everything to be able to be proven. We want to be able to understand everything. And that's why instead of the spiritual realm, we, we prefer the natural realm. But here's one of the things I want to say about the natural realm today. The natural is of nature, which you're like, thank you very much. Nobody wrote that down. It's of nature, Meaning uh, it's what comes natural in the world. And when you think of nature in general, nature is violent and it's unpredictable and it's unrelenting and it's terrorizing. 
And, and when you're little boys, it's kind of entertaining, especially when it comes to like animals and stuff. In fact, I follow this social media account just because of my, my boys, um, because they're, they're too young and wouldn't appreciate it for me to take them on an actual safari. It's too expensive and too far away. Um, so the safari comes to my phone by way of Instagram. And there's this one Instagram called Nature is Metal. If you have a weak stomach, you should not follow them. But Nature is Metal has these, these unbelievable videos about what happens in nature amongst animals. I just thought I'd show maybe an example. Anybody interested? It's a tame one. I promise it'll be okay. So there, this is, this is the, the Instagram and, and, and there's this warthog and he's you know, doing what he naturally does. He goes to the watering hole and you never know what's gonna happen, um, but there's danger. Look. And this gigantic alligator, there was no ripples in the water, nothing's going on, this alligator, and he doesn't get what he wants and he's mad, but I want you to listen. Listen real quick. Listen to the warthog. It's like the warthog's laughing and taunting him. I love it. So, but, but it's like, this is nature. It knows nothing of justice and fairness or compassion. There's no forgiveness. There's no grace. There's no generosity. There's very little sharing. Like that's, that's what's, what's natural. That's what's nature. In fact, human nature is not that different. Human nature brought us racism and terrorism and trafficking and genocide. Kill or be killed mentality, an eye for an eye, look out for number one, might makes right. This is what comes naturally. The question is, where does all this come from? Like, like what, what's at the root of that? I mean, who taught us these things? I mean, this is something that's been debated for years. And so I had somebody write to me recently and they were like, hey, when you first started out all the science-y stuff, I wasn't so sure about it. I really love the message, but I was like, okay, so today we're not gonna go the science-y route. We're gonna go philosophy and don't tune me out. Some of you are gonna be like, well, do I really need to know this? Yes, you do. I told you at the beginning, I want you to be thoughtful about your faith and it's fine for you to disagree with me. But where this comes from has been debated for, for we have record for at least 3,000 years, if not further back. Well, you're like, well, what do I mean by that? Well, if you think about philosophy, ancient philosophy, uh, and, and we could go back further, but specifically as it relates to this question of what drives humanity and, and what, what inspires and motivates and leads humanity, it began with Plato's thinking and Platonic thinking is about 6th century B.C., I mean, these are, these, are, these are things that we have documents of, these writings. And, and Plato was sort of suggested that what we perceive in the world is not true reality. It reflects, it reflects an ideal, that there's, there, there, there's an ideal out there that's greater, that's better than what we experience in this world. And we're inspired by that because we think, well, this isn't quite right, or I'm not experiencing what I want, and there must be something better to reach for. And uh, years later, a guy named Plotinus, he built on that, that uh, Platonistic thinking, and then Augustine followed him, and, and they all agreed there was sort of this same trajectory that there's this transcendence that, that we're shooting for. There's, there's a transcendent uh, idea of all the things we experience in the world, and, and, and it's greater than what we're experiencing. And so we stretch and we, 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 we lean towards that, and coupled with, with uh, uh, Judeo-Christian ideas, uh, Augustine said that love or ultimate good are things that, that, that drive us as a society and as humanity. And, and we've seen some uh, uh, experience of that. In fact, that's what shaped much of the West because prior to sort of this thinking and Judeo-Christian values, like these things, these all existed and they ruled the world. What we don't realize because we're the beneficiaries because we never experienced the world the way it used to be, that, that's new. That's, that's new in, in, uh, in the human, uh, or excuse me, the human uh, history. And so um, fast forward years, some, you know, let's, let's call it 14, 1500 years after, after the Apostle Paul and, and some of Augustine's writings. And, and we have the modern era where there's modern philosophers. And it certainly started before this, but Marx was one of the first ones to kind of speak out on this idea. And he talked about economics and specifically prosperity. That, that prosperity was something that, that was what drove the human experience. It's like, no, no, societies and people and governments and people groups, they're driven by economics and economics pros, economical uh, prosperity is what drives their, their, um, their behavior. And Nietzsche came after Marx and said he was close, but he wasn't quite right. 
And Nietzsche said, it, the reason they want prosperity is because prosperity is what leads to power. And that power is what people are actually after. And that that's what they really want, the ability to control and the, the ability to dominate. And Freud, he, he came after them and he's not really a philosopher, but he, he sort of spoke uh, in opposition to the philosophical community. And as a psychoanalyst, he said, no, no, we, we actually, uh, from a psychoanalytical uh, analytical standpoint, we, we've observed and we can prove that humans are actually driven not by prosperity or power, that they leverage those things for the sake of pleasure. In fact, what Freud said was that, that when you don't get what you want, when you don't satisfy your deepest pleasures, that's the beginning of what he said is the beginning of all neurosis, when things go wrong, when things go wrong inside of you and things go wrong in the world. And so into the conversation, we insert the Apostle Paul's writings. Now, we're at a church, we're at a church so we're going to look at the Bible. What does the Bible have to say about this? And here's the thing. Just give me a little leeway for a second because I think if the Apostle Paul was here, and he said, we were to ask the apostle Paul, okay, Paul, you look at this. I mean, there's a group of people. And, and by the way, this is, this is you know, this, this debate is, has been going on for somewhere, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 3,000 years that we have documented, may, maybe longer. And if we say to the apostle Paul, okay, Paul, which one is it? I mean, is it the ideal and the transcendent love and good? Is that what motivates people? Or, or is it prosperity and power and pleasure? I think the apostle Paul would look at it and he'd go, Yep. Yep, that's it. Oh, but which one is it? It's all of that. In fact, the, the scripture we're going to look at today, if you have a Bible, Galatians chapter 5. I'd love for you to open your Bible if you have one. If you don't have one, we want you to have one. I'll give you one if you can't afford one. But um, where, whatever campus you're at, let them know. We'd, we'd love for you to have a Bible. Um, but if you have a device and you have U version, you can open it there too. But, but here's the thing. The Apostle Paul says, hey, this actually represents a conflict that's going on inside of you. And yes, these are the forces that are at work. And so here's his suggestion. He starts with this. He says in Galatians chapter five, beginning of verse 16, he says, so I say this, uh, the, this, is, this is happening. And this, these forces are at work. I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The, the sinful nature, uh, it wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the, the spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. And then he says this, he says, these two forces, these two forces, the, the spirit and the sinful nature are constantly fighting each other. So you're not free to carry out your good Intentions, even your best intentions, your best desires. You're not free because these forces are too powerful in your lives, in your, your, your life. They're, both of these forces are, are exerting some level of influence on you and they're being driven by something. These things point to something greater that, that's influencing them. And the, the thing that the ideal and the transcendent and love and good is pointing to is the spirit of God and its work in your life. It's influence uh, over, over your consciousness, over your mind, your thoughts that drive your behaviors. And then over here, he, he says, you know, this is driven by the sin nature. It, it, it is what comes natural, but it's corrupted by sin. And so you have this sin nature that's driving. And these two things are, are warring against each other. And you're, you're sort of here in the middle. And you're going to like you, by the way, because you're handsome, uh, you guys, and that's as close as I can get uh, to, I don't do people well, by the way. Um, but, but this is you, and you're in the middle. And there's, there's these, these forces, these two forces that are constantly competing. And come on, isn't this true? This is what happens in your consciousness. You're constantly like, you know, I really want to do this, but I, I know I really should do this. Like, I mean, this, this starts really young and it like, it plagues you in college and you almost always do what you want to do and not what you should do. But like, you, you've, you've dealt with this your whole life. And when you do what you want to do rather than what you should do, there, there's consequences to that and you don't feel good about that. And when you do what you should do oftentimes and not what you want, you feel bad about that as well at times. And it's like, there's this battle and you, you, feel, you feel neurotic. You go back and forth. And the Apostle Paul says, these, these, it's because these forces are battling inside of you. He says, but, but when you're directed by the Spirit, 
you're not under obligation to the law of Moses. It's like, what does that mean? That seems like a hard left turn, Paul. And he says, no, no, here's the point. The point is there were certain laws that were given to people. They were given by God and we have laws in the world. And, and the point is when you're directed or you're guided by the spirit, you, you don't have to rely on your own ability to keep the law. And there's, there's, it, it, it's, when it comes to the spirit, the truth is, is we're guided by the spirit. But with the law, with, with our sinful nature, this is something that needs to be governed. Which, when you think about it, we all know what that's like. Because he says, he says look, when you, follow, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the result's very clear. And there are certain things that happen. I mean, the sinful nature, we have to govern that because when you follow the sinful nature, we all know what happens, right? When, when you do what comes natural, or when other people do what comes natural, when they follow their natural desires, the results are clear, he says, and here they are. And look at this list. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these as if there weren't enough up here. We needed like just a catch all at the end. And it's like this, by the way, I know, here's what I know. I know this makes us all feel a little nervous. We sort of squirm because it's like, mine's up there. The one I struggle with, my, mine too, by the way, mine's up there. So I just thought we'd turn to our neighbor and we would all identify which one is ours that we dominated, dominated, by, dominated by most. It's not a good idea. No, let's, let's not do that. That's not the point. But here's the, here's the point. This is what's so interesting. When you look at this list, isn't it true that the primary source of what drives this is what the philosophers told us? It's prosperity and it's power and it's pleasure. And when I don't get what I want, when I get what I want, it's sexual immorality and it's impurity and lustful pleasures. When I don't wanna get what I want, it's hostility and quarreling and jealousy and outbursts of anger. It's like, how did Paul know? I'll tell you how it turns out when it comes to sinful nature, it just takes one to know one. And we all have it. So we all know. We know what happens when we do what comes naturally. Nobody's ever had to work hard to become good at any of these things, right? Like you didn't have to teach your kids how to be selfish instead of sharing. It's like, hey, listen, no, 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 no. Stop sharing with those kids. You might run out of what you have. So you can't share all the time? That's not good. Nobody, you don't have to teach kids that. You don't have to teach them selfishness. You don't have to teach them how to lie. Hey, listen, not everything. You don't have to tell everybody everything. You don't have to tell the full truth all the time. It's like they know that. That comes natural. And nobody had, had to teach you, you didn't have to go to school, how to learn how to cheat on your taxes, right? <laughs> Nervous laughter in the room for that one. It's like, you know, what, pick your thing. I mean, it, it, you didn't have to be taught how to follow the sinful nature. Here, here's, here's the truth is we've created laws. We've created laws to govern what comes naturally, which is strange, isn't it? I mean, have you ever thought about this? Why do we need laws against mistreating, owning, and killing people? I mean, as Westerners, we think that seems absurd that you need laws, but none of us want to live in a land where there aren't laws against mistreating, owning, or killing people or other things. We, want, we, we realize that as, as humans, we need to be governed because when we leave it up to what comes naturally to us, chaos ensues and all sorts of harm happens and the sinful nature, it leads us towards brokenness and destruction. But, the Apostle Paul says, but the Holy Spirit, he produces something different. He produces this kind of fruit in our lives. He produces love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. There is no law, as if he needed to tell us, there is no law against these things. Here's what's interesting. These things over here, they require laws. They require rules, right? You have to have rules for what the sinful nature, what comes naturally to us. But over here, this, this stuff that comes from the Spirit, there's no restrictions necessary. You don't need any restrictions for any of that. It's like, no, no, we've never had anybody go, hold on a second. 
you're not a lot of love people that much. You, wait, we got people way too happy around here. We need laws to govern people that are happy. There's way too much peace. Somebody needs to stir up some conflict. Like this is way too peaceful. Like that sounds absurd. And it's because you don't need laws against these things. And these are the things that are, we're led by the spirit to do. There, there's no restrictions necessary when we're guided by the spirit is what Paul's saying. But when we follow the sinful nature, it needs to be governed and it requires rules. He, he goes on, he says this, he says something interesting. Those who belong to Christ Jesus. So getting towards me and you, what do we do about this, this tension? Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of the sinful nature. These things, this desire for us, uh, for, for prosperity and for power and for pleasure, these passions and desires of the sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. That these are things we no longer, we no longer have to pay a penalty for when we're in Christ, those who belong to Christ. But we're no longer, uh, we're no longer under their power either. We're no longer dominated by them. You actually experience freedom from the sinful nature. You don't have to be controlled by it anymore. He, in fact, he says, since we're living by the Spirit, you've been given new life by the Spirit. The Spirit was placed inside of you. Let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. If you have your Bible open, your, your translation, it's the most uh, famous one in the NIV, is to keep in step with the Spirit is how it's translated. This idea of to follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our life is, is in the NIV. It says to keep in step with the Spirit, which is different than, you know, like when you're, when you're out of line, you gotta get back in line, right? We gotta keep people in line. And it's this difference between walking in the Spirit and keeping in step with the Spirit and getting in line. And if, if you grew up in church or you've been around church for a long time, if you're new to church, you, you may not know this, but like, you know, one of the things that's really difficult that we've had a hard time balancing is what does it look like to have a relationship with God? And, and this is more, what, what the Paul's talking about is more about a relationship with God. And this over here is about religion, which is why he said, you no longer have to be governed by the law of Moses. That's not what, what this is about anymore. It's not about policing people's behavior. If you'll not only live, but if you'll follow the Spirit's leading in every part of your lives, you don't need laws and restrictions for that if you keep in step with the Spirit. The, the problem is, and, and the real tension is, many, if not most Christians, would claim they've never sensed the promptings or heard the whispers of the Spirit's direction or leading in their lives before. So how do you do this? How do you, in a, in a non-strange way, like, without, like, Okay, which way, which way am I going? It's like, how do you know, how are you guided by the Spirit? Now, if we back up, we just read a couple of scriptures that give us two incredible clues or specifically two keys that draw out um, how we do this. If we back up, he says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit. This is written to uh, people in a primarily agrarian society. And the production of fruit was a result of two things. The first of something being planted, which is the idea of the Holy Spirit. When we talked about this in week one, when, 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 you're, when the Spirit was given, it's given to people universally, all, everyone who belongs to Christ, the Spirit is planted inside of you in your life. That's why Jesus said it was better. The Spirit's there to create and to guide and to empower you. So the Spirit's planting your life, that's God's part. But for something to grow and bear fruit, it has to be planted and cultivated. It, it can't, it's not enough just for it to be planted. The spirit has to be cultivated in your life. Now, this is, this is the key. Is, this is because this is our part. This is our role. And some of us, we've never been taught to do our role. Like, what does it look like for me to cult cultivate this? Because this takes time and attention. And just like any relationship, it takes time and attention. Life in the spirit is cultivated, uh, as Paul said, as, as we keep in step with the spirit. That's how we follow the guide. Now, I want you to think about this. You followed guides in many ways in your life. Somebody guided your career. Somebody gave you some guidance in a relationship that you were in. Somebody's guided you, uh, those of you who dealt with difficult issues in parenting, you've allowed people to guide you in different ways. And how did you do it? 
You begin to pay attention and tune into specific voices that you wanted to trust. The Apostle Paul, I believe, saying the same thing. He said, if you want to follow the Spirit, keep in step with the Spirit, you have to tune into the voice of the Spirit. This is what Jesus said. Anyone who has ears to hear should listen and understand. If you, if you have ears to hear, if you'll pay attention, you'll hear. And if you listen and you understand, you'll begin to follow the way of the Spirit, and things will go well for you. It's like in my house. Um, oftentimes, I have this conversation with my kids where I'm like, hey, did you not hear your mom? And they're like, yes, sir. And I'm like, well, why aren't you listening? And they're like, well, I don't understand why I had to do this or why I had to do that or why I have to do it right now. And it's like, well, if you'll not only hear what she had to say, if you'll listen and you'll do it, you'll then begin to understand. The more you tune into and hear and listen to God's word through his general will, he's given to all of us through his scriptures. The more you hear God's general will through his word, the easier it'll be to recognize his voice and understand his personal will for you that he speaks through his spirit. God is speaking. There's certain things in the scriptures that, you know, there's principles and there's ideas, but like, what do I do about this specific situation? What do I do in this? What's the right decision for this? And I believe that's how the spirit leads us and guides us. The more familiar we are with God's general will and his word, the clearer it is for us to discern the spirit and his personal will. So my question for you is, how are you doing at tuning in to the voice of the spirit? Maybe more poignant is, how often are you tuning in to the voice of the Spirit? My guess is, is it's probably not as frequently as you're tuning into other voices or other influences in your life. If we're friends, stay to the end, don't leave when I say this, but I just, I wanna press you a little bit further. If this one hour a week is your plan for tuning into the voice of God and his spirit, it will be drowned out by the noise of the world. You will not be able to hear and discern the voice of the spirit of God who's wanting to communicate to you personally and intimately. If you're tuning in one day a week, maybe one hour a week, That'll get drowned out by the noise of the world, which leads me to key number two, to tune into the voice of the Spirit of God. You can't do that unless you learn to tune out the noise of the world. Did you know that the average person receives somewhere uh, between six and 10,000 messages a day? You see between six and 10,000 messages a day. I, I guess it depends on what generation you are in and whether you're on social media or not. So there's, you're somewhere, everybody falls somewhere in between those two. Did you know that this isn't by accident that last year in the United States alone, that the majority of the noise was, was driven by the advertising, marketing uh, industry. Last year, that industry grew by 15% to an all-time high of $259 billion are spent filling your mind with messages, trying to get your attention it's the strongest growth in 40 years and it's not slowing down. You have no chance against that. And you don't even have to tune into their messages because they're tuning into you. Every time you press accept cookies, which I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. It makes it easier, but you accept cookies and big data and Siri and Alexa, you know they're listening because you talk and then stuff shows up on your Alexa or it shows up on your Instagram feed and in-app cross-marketing and push notifications and location-based messages. Did you know that the mobile market alone, just mobile advertising and messages being sent to you, $100 billion spent this last year. $100 billion. It's estimated that by 2027, it'll be $300 billion. That's how quickly that industry is growing. The overwhelming majority of these messages are tapping into the passions and desires. This noise of the world is about the passions and desires of the sinful nature. It's appealing to your desire for prosperity and for power and for pleasure for you. And, and the truth is, is, is this is enter into this conversation, uh, the Apostle Paul who's saying, look, 
You don't have to be dominated by that. You're tuning into it way too much and you need to tune something down. But here's the thing. Those who, to back up, those who belong to Christ Jesus, they've nailed those passions and desires of sinful nature to the cross. You have the ability to say no. And it happens when you choose to crucify. They've been crucified, but you have to choose on a regular basis to crucify these desires. To, to sacrifice these sinful desires on a regular basis and sacrifice the appeal they have in your life. You have that ability by the power of the Spirit inside of you. This is what it means to take up your cross. To take up your cross daily is, is to go, hey, I have certain things that I need to die to, certain desires that I know if I follow them, if I do what's natural, it's not gonna go well for me. And you've been given the power inside of you to say no, to crucify those desires, to tune out that noise and tune into something else. You see, but both of these things, tuning into the voice of the Spirit and tuning out the noise of the world, both of these things require an ancient discipline. And it's one that's, that's vanished from our society. And throughout the scriptures, it's this thing that's, that's repeated over and over, and primarily in the Psalms. We're told two words to be Still, I know some of you are going, yeah, but I got four kids, me too. And, and, and I have a full-time job, me too. And I have a wife and she works and mine too. And, and I've got all these things in these, these places I'm volunteering and these things I'm involved in. I'm on this committee and I'm on this board and my, my fantasy football league and I'm getting crushed there. And I got so many things going on, me too. And the encouragement of the scriptures over and over is be still. It's a huge theme in the Psalms. In fact, David, um, this is what I believe uh, separated David. I mean, with all of his faults and failures, it was the key to, be, to David be, being come known as a man after God's own heart. It happened because David had a rhythm of choosing to be still, which is not easy. But when you tune out the noise and when you choose to be quiet and be still, that's when you can hear the still, small voice, the whispers of God, which you gotta wonder, like, I mean, if, if God's large and in charge and he's bigger than the universe, it's like, why does he whisper? I don't have a verse for this. He doesn't always whisper, by the way. But I don't have a verse for this, but here's why I think God whispers, and I think it's why it's his preferred method of communication, and I, it's because he wants to be close to you. I believe that with my whole heart. God wants to be near to you. Yes, you. He, he, he loves you. He, he wants to move you towards you. In fact, this is the story of Scripture, that, that our sin separated us from God and then God sent his son to be near us, to come near, to make a sacrifice for you and for me, to not only pay the penalty for our sin, but to give us the power to overcome the brokenness of our world. And then he said it was better for him to go that he would send one that would not only be with us and with you, he would be in you. And he would guide you and he would empower you. Here's my question. When do you get still? Like, I'm not saying when do you stop activity. Like, when do you get still and not just still your activity, but, but your mind? When do you get so quiet? When do you... You lower the ambient noise in your life enough that you can tune in to hear the whispers of the Spirit of God who wants to guide and direct your life. Make no mistake. We, we are all guided by one of these two forces. This is what Paul said. These two forces are warring such that you can't, you, you can't carry out your own good intentions. So that's out the, out the window. One of these two forces will guide your life. Turns out it's not really a 3,000 year debate. The debate's not, will one or the other of these, which one's the most powerful? It's which one will you allow to be the most powerful in your life? And you know what's interesting? Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I'm not great at people, but this is sort of the debate, right? 
It's like, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know which one, which way I should go, what, what the right decision is. And, and it's funny because um, the philosophers and even the psychologists don't have a, a great example for this. And I'm not good at people, by the way. I'm just gonna admit that out loud. I'm not good at writing, drawing people, but this is my best attempt. It, it's, this is the age old debate. And this is what it looks like. It's like, hey, I, I don't know which one of these wins out, but, but there's one on my one shoulder that's kind of influencing me this way. And he kind of looks like this. And, and, you know, he carries one of these. And, and he's got a tail that looks like this. And it looks more like a cat, which might be intentional. I don't know. Um, but, 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 and he's influencing me in one direction. And then, and then there's, there's this other guy and there's a handsome fellow over here and he's got one of these over his head and, and he's, got, he's got these on his shoulders. And, and the truth is, is, is he's influencing me to go in a different direction. And I have these two voices and they're competing and they're warring in my life. What do I do? The question is, which one of these forces will guide your life? I'll tell you the answer. It depends on which one you're tuning into the most. When you tune into the voice of the Spirit of God, it requires you to tune out the noise of the world. And so here's what I wanna do. And what I wanna do today is I wanna, I wanna conclude by giving you a gift. And it's a gift that's rarely given in our society. So I'm gonna give you this rare gift, but it's gonna require a lot of discipline on your part. The gift I'm gonna give you today is 60 seconds to be still. And you're gonna be shocked at how long 60 seconds feels. But here's what I'm asking you to do. Would you just put your phones away? Would you try to clear your mind? Would you just close your eyes? I mean, external posture is important uh, and it, it dictates our internal posture. So I want you to close your eyes and I want you to open your hands. Nobody's looking at anybody. Just open your hands and turn your palms up. This is a prayer posture. It's a receiving posture. Saying, God, I want to receive from you. And here's all I'm going to say. Is I just want you to focus your mind on this one idea. God, form my thoughts in my, form your thoughts in my consciousness. Give me your thoughts. Direct me by the power of your spirit. I want to hear from you today as we've been talking something in your life. Maybe something that was on that awful list I put on TV. It's plaguing you. You've had this force, this battle between these two things over and over and over. And maybe you're losing. You're going, God, guide me. Help me to know what to do next. I believe he'll speak to you. It's gonna require discipline. You're gonna to have to tune out your thoughts about lunch and about picking up your kids and about what's going on this afternoon and what's happening tomorrow. And just be still and quiet your spirit, the spirit that was created in the image of God so that he could connect with your spirit and speak to you and guide you and lead you. So I'm gonna give you 60 seconds beginning now to be still, to be quiet to be directed by the Spirit. God, maybe in these quiet moments, 
maybe someone in the room or in one of our rooms or someone in their own room or in their car, maybe someone halfway around the world heard from you for the first time as you directed their thoughts, maybe not an audible voice, but as you directed their thoughts in their mind, guiding their thoughts to be focused and directed towards the way in which you would want them to go. Maybe some of us didn't hear from you for the first time, but maybe it was the first time in a long time. And it's the first time in a long time we've been still enough and quieted our spirit enough to allow you to speak to us. In a spirit of honesty, some of us, we didn't hear anything. And we wonder if we're doing it wrong or if there's a reason we can't hear. And I think if there's anything that's true today, it's, it's the clarity that You've promised that you will speak if we're listening. If we have ears to hear, that you will instruct and you will guide, that you will whisper to us. So pray for somebody who's here today who didn't sense a leading in their spirit, that they would maybe hunger for that and they would maybe begin to practice quietness in their life and stillness because maybe the noise, the residual noise is too much. It's such that they can't hear your leading and hear your voice. I don't believe there's anything magical or super mystical about how we hear from you. But there is a a mystery to the fact that you guide our conscience. And I don't know how and why and when, but I just pray we'd be people that would tune into your voice and that as we tune into your voice, that your creating and your empowering and your guiding spirit would rest on us as a people. That individually and corporately, we would be a group of people that experiences the presence of your spirit, your presence, your essence, God, on a regular basis. We would know your nearness. We would hear your voice and the clarity of it. And that we would know that it's not about what we do or what we don't do. It's about how we get still to hear from you, that you lead and guide us in our lives. So I pray that your power would rest on us in a beautiful way to guide us in the way that we should go. Teach us to follow you the life that you promised us. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.